All right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Pawtucket School Committee work session virtual meeting on Thursday, April 29th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Miss Liss, please take a roll call. Miss Spinello. Here. Miss Doobie. Here. Miss Grant. Here. Mr. Knight. Mr. Larvey. Here. Mr. Marino. Here. Mr. Chauvinow. Here. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation mm -hmm. under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. <clears throat> to public participation. Miss List, has anyone signed up? No. All right. We will move to approval of previous meeting minutes from 41321 and 42021. So moved. Second. Motion to approve the minutes of 41321 and 42021 by Mr. Marino, seconded by Ms. Grant. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, new business discussion action items. Approval of FY22 budget. Motion to approve. Motion to approve the fiscal year 2022 budget by Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Ms. Grant. Any discussion? I know we had a public hearing, and I think that answered most all committee members' questions. Anything else on the budget before we call the roll? All right, there being no other discussion, roll call on the approval of the FY22 budget, please. Ms. Bonolo? Yes. Ms. Doobie? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Mr. Larby? Yes. Mr. Marino? Yes. Mr. Chabonel? Yes. All right, approval of the appointment of Mr. Ricardo Pimentel as the school department represent representative on the art panel review committee, June 1st, 2021 through May 31st, 2024. Motion moved. Motion Second. to approve the appointment of Ricardo Pimentel as the school department representative on the arts panel review committee from the term of June 1st, 2021 through June, May 31st of 2024 by Mr. Lobby, seconded by Ms. Panolo. Discussion on the appointment of Mr. Pimentel. Ms. Grant. Um, could someone just maybe clarify um, this position and is there anyone else on the, the committee? Yes. yes, Chair, thank you. Yes, so um, Mr. Pimento is being recommended for approval for the Arts Review Panel. This is the panel um, with the uh, city. It's a, um, it's a committee, a sub uh, committee of the City Council Arts Review, where they review the grants that are focused on arts in our city. And uh, Mr. Pimento is um, a very uh, significant qualified candidate as he does lead the arts school and has a lot of experience um, working with the five um, arts programs at JMW. And he has been on the committee um, before. So this is, this isn't actually a school, school department or school mm -hmm. um, committee, school district position, correct? No, no, it's, um, it's, it's actually uh, something that a subcommittee that was started probably about, I think I was on it about 15 years ago, um, started I think in 2006. And it was a way to generate uh, support of the arts in the community. And there are grants given out to various um, agencies within the community that um, and they wanted a representative from the school department. So there's always been a representative of the school department on this particular arts review panel. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on the appointment of Mr. Pimentel? There being none, roll call on the approval, please. Ms. Bonolo. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Lobby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chauvinow. Yes. Approval of the parking lot play yard upgrades. Motion to approve. Second. 
Motion to approve the parking lot play yard upgrades by Ms. Grant, seconded by Ms. Bonolo. Discussion on this? <clears throat> Ms. Grant? Um, could maybe someone tell us um, what's going to happen and what, what this means? Maybe kind of share what what that what that approval is for who wants to take that mr cody superintendent i believe chris silver is on the line he he was going to do that first can you let mr silver in he's coming in right now Hey, Chris. How are you doing tonight? Good. How are you? Not bad. Not bad. Um, all right. The scope of the work would consist of the play, the lodge and the small play yards at Curvin McCabe. Um, there would be saw cut, patched, crack filled, and seal coated. Um, the same thing with the state pre-K play yard at Fallon and the Play, the lodge play yard over at Curtis, which is very uneven, and the uh, I think the pre pre K kids play on it. It's the one in the front that wraps around. We're gonna try to even that out and seal coat that also, and plus at Varier from last year's upgrades, we need to uh, continue some additional lot striping for the bus uh, bus lane and for a fire lane. All right, we've got, so, uh, Greg, go ahead with your follow up and then we'll go okay. to Ms. Panolo and then Ms. Doobie. Okay, so this um, particular um, item that we're approving is just basically kind of for the parking lot, um, going them and, or in Curtis a play yard to kind of make even. Yes, both in the curving is the both play yards. Curtis is a play yard, Fallon is the state pre-K play yard, and Varrier is uh, the lot striping, the parking lot. Oh, okay, so it's all about groundwork. Yes, it's the same company that started last year with the upgrades in the various parking lots. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Ms. Panolo. Ms. Panolo, you're on mute. I said, I believe that answered my question. It has nothing to do with the playgrounds per se. No. Okay. Miss Doobie. Um, I just like to say that I know that we do these huge projects, um, but not that I'm more excited about this stuff, but I honestly, Mr. Moreno and I have been walking around to our schools and it's the maintenance we're doing in our buildings that aren't the ones we're talking about. That is really impressing me that we're walking around Cunningham and Fallon and we're seeing what it is to keep up a school. Yes. To not allow our schools to fall into disrepair to the point that ceilings collapse. And we're like, wow, we need to bulldoze this entire thing. So I really appreciate that the team and I'm sure Colliers is part of the, some of this stuff as well. And, but also that our committee continues to move forward with these maintenance projects that might not be as glitzy, but really make a difference in our schools, just being places where kids can enjoy being there. Thank you. Uh, and just a, a couple of comments. One is, I know Kervin just received a grant for some trees to be planted Correct. around the exterior. This won't impede that or affect that in any no, it won't. Real way, right? Okay. No. And Melissa, as a takeaway, can you check um, with some of the relief money that's due into the community? Would would new asphalt be an acceptable expense, given the fact that you know we're promoting? fresh air and get the kids outside and, and so forth. I just, I, I'd like you to look into that when you get a chance, Melissa, because while I, I, I appreciate and I agree with 
Miss Doobie on on the the extraordinary efforts our maintenance department makes day in and day out. I think at some point we need to start looking at digging up some of these to Mr. Silver's point, the uneven parking lots and some of our parking lots are in rough shape. So if we could dig them up and redo it um, using some of that uh, relief money, that, that may be a, an opportunity for us to, to look at. Yeah, actually it's funny that you mentioned that. I just had a uh, meeting with Chris and John tomorrow to talk about that. We, we haven't received the, the regs on the lodger, which is SO3. We are starting to look at some of the things that will help because some of, I mean, there's a lot of money in that, in that next um, group. And, um, you know, thinking about things that make these buildings better and the areas better. Um, we're meeting on that tomorrow morning at 730. So um, we certainly will look into it and then run everything by Cheryl and then uh, to the committee. Okay, great. Any other discussions on this? Roll call on the approval, please. Ms. Manolo. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chauvinow. Yes. All right, uh, approval of RFP proposal, automatic temperature controls. Chris, are you taking this one too, or is John? John's taking that one. Oh, one this right. will be me. Um, I did want to interrupt early, but uh, we meant we, we should have mentioned that we also went out and put about $8,000 into replacement parts and upgrading the playground at Baldwin. Um, we found that it would be cheaper for us to go out and actually buy the parts and have our maintenance department do that. So they just finished that. Chris has just over the week, past couple of weeks, had mulch being put into a lot of our different playgrounds and we have another round coming in. I think, Chris, it's probably close to 40 or 50 yards of mulch into our playgrounds in Baldwin and a couple other buildings will be getting those soon. Yes. Um, uh, replacement or failed or outdated pneumatic controls with new back net DDC controls. To summarize what we had discussed a few weeks earlier having to do with transfers, the administration building number three pneumatics in most cases were eliminated or abandoned over the past years. We would like to introduce sensors and controls, BMS connections and VFD pumps uh, so that we can control areas like Melissa's area, which would be business office, IT, which takes over two separate floors to uh, also control heat in their offices. Because um, as of right now, we have run on heat and we basically, it's been that way since I've been in the system, or at least in this job, to where we have to make guesses on when to turn the heat on, when to turn it off, send people in on weekends. So we went out and we contacted three companies, um, two off of the MPA, which one walked our building completely, took about three and a half hours, and then didn't give us a proposal. Um, it was a local company, it was Arden. We reached out to them and they still didn't come up with a proposal. The other company never got back to us. And the third company, which is Automatic Temperature Controls, which is our current vendor, uh, came back with a proposal of $112,853.50. As you can see, I have summarized on each floor what they plan on doing. Um, one of them says VFD controls. I didn't put out what it was. It's, it's variable frequency drives, which it means that you don't have to run a pump all out. New controls, when you control that, I can do it half, I can do it whole, I can do it three quarters. It's a cost saving feature. We also have these in fans, exhaust fans in our newer buildings. I've also reached out in preparation, hopefully, with the committee's approval, uh, approval to National Grid for incentives through uh, Jerry German, um, which I don't think it would be substantial, but any cost savings um, would be nice. Um, based on the proposal that I have received, I would ask the school committee on uh, my recommendation to award the automatic temperature controls with a bid. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve the award for automatic temperature controls to John, the firm again? Uh, automatic temperature controls. That's the name of the company. Automatic temperature controls. Yeah. Okay. By Ms. Panolo, seconded by Ms. Grant. Ms. Uh, discussion, Ms. Panolo. Is that like putting zones in? Yes, it's, it's, 
Yes, it is. It's like in your home. You would have a zone in, say, your basement, your first floor, and now you can control it. Right now, we don't have any control over any of the offices in the third building to the left. So they would be coming in, and they're also going to be doing valve work which means if Melissa's area is too hot, I can shut the valves off there without affecting Hirsch's area and his other three floors. So it's just like your house in a certain way where we'll now be able to control the heat where I think before, when I first came into the system in Pawtucket, we were in heat 24 seven and we had no control. And that's similar what this building has been doing other than Chris and myself setting up schedules. So we would come in and turn heat on and, and turn heat off so people would be comfortable. So this ultimately will be a cost saving. Do, is um, in the IT department, do they have special cooling area for their, I haven't they been do, up there in a long time. They, they do, well, that side of the building also has separate condensers for cooling. And that's a discussion for the future because I believe they're as old as probably the building themselves, but currently doing fine. But when it came to the heat, we had zero control over the heat in any space. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Marino. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so I'm just um, curious as to why the, why the um, lack of engagement of, from the other firms who we were to reach out to. I can't really answer to that. I do know that I've also reached out to them about condenser lines in which we have spoke about. And it seems like there seems to be a lot of work going on right now in Rhode Island. So it's not, I don't think that it's not engaged. It's just, they might not have the manpower for it right now and they're not committing to it. Whereas a company like Arden, I, anytime I ever used to reach out to them in the past, they were always there. Um, I just think that, I don't know if it was a lack of interest or they just didn't have the time, but one company not getting back to me, I say two years ago, they all three would have come back to me immediately with prices. Um, I just think it's a matter of there's so much work going on in the state right now. Thank you. John. John, and I assume this is a, a, a system that you can operate remotely, right? Yes, this is gonna be controlled through the uh, building maintenance system, which would be laptop, which we could, like I said, I can do it from my house, which connected, uh, Hirsch would connect me. And it makes it easier for us. We can put everything on timing schedules. So heat will go off at a certain time. Similar what happens to the other sides of the building and what happens to Potter and Green and Jenks. And with all the upgrades we'll be doing at Curvin, we'll have same thing, state-of-the-art materials so that we won't have to worry about somebody having to come in and turn boilers on and off. We'll be uh, temperature controlled throughout the building. Well, perfect. There's a motion on the floor to award the proposal of automatic temperature controls. It's been seconded. No further discussion on this. Roll call on the approval, please. Ms. Pinello. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chavano. Yes. Approval of vendor for student planners. Melissa, is this you? Hi, yes, thank you. Um, so before you, uh, we have uh, issued a uh, request for proposal for planners, and we've received three proposals on April 14th. They were from uh, three companies, one being Entourage Imaging, uh, the second one Schoolmate, and the third one SDI Innovations, which is uh, a DBA school date books. The uh, lowest, um, Price was from Entourage. I had a meeting with Assistant Superintendent Ramsey, who uh, looked at the product and felt um, we both felt that Entourage was um, more than capable of providing. They provided samples to us, and um, again, again, without my knowledge of knowing um, what's best in the schools, um, Mrs. Ramsey was able to uh, support me. And the estimated annual cost. Uh, if awarded to Entourage, would be approximately six thousand one seventy six fifty per year, for three years. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve the bid award for student planners to Entourage by Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Mr. Marino. Discussion, Ms. Duby. Are these planners customizable to our district? Um, as in, you know, we, we have our, we have our calendar, which I know, you know, we haven't approved yet, but where we could put the days like PD day, um, 
April vacation, you know, we could, can, I mean, you, you can just stop me now with a shake of the head if I'm, if, if it's a no, but like, can we do this so that it, it's an, it's personalized to our district or is it like you just get the standard? So we, we put the proposal out to be generic so that we could buy the same across the, all of the schools um, back in previous years. And Mrs. Ramsey can probably answer better to this. They used to be customizable. Um, but I think now that uh, we use a more generic one um, and then we can group together, um, they can change the covers um, at the grade levels. Uh, but again, if uh, customizing would probably add some pricing. Um, I don't know. If I'm sorry. I said, thanks for clarifying. Oh, you're welcome. But I don't know if there's an option. Maybe we can look at possibly doing an insert page, but I can, I can check that out. You know, like it tells us, you know, in the cover. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, we could also just give them an insert, you know, <laughs> you know, to put it, but I was just well, making sure that if, that if it did, if it was part of our package that we're using it to its fullest potential, you know, and, and making sure we're taking advantage of all of the options if they're part of the, if they're part of the package. Right. I do. I, I will um, mention that the hall passes are part of it at the secondary level. Anything else on this? What, what does $6,176 a year buy us? How many planners is that? The, hold on, at the elementary, um, it's 2,430 and at the secondary, it's 1,030. We, uh, we did a, uh, account by all the school input administrators to see who wanted to use them. And um, that's what we came up with. So it's a little, what is it, uh, 3400 All right. Boy, that seems awfully cheap. It is. I mean, they're, they're you know, the elementary is $1.80 a piece and um, $1.75 at the secondary level, which um, schoolmate was, you know, almost $3 at the elementary level and $3 at the secondary. All right. Ms. Bonolo and then Ms. Grant. That mute button. Do we have any schools that are not using them? Hmm. Mrs. Ramsey? I can't remember. Uh, there are no schools. Hi, everyone. There are no schools that aren't using them in it, their entirety, um, but not every student. They didn't order them for all their population because they go unused every year. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Grant? That was my same question, so I'm all set. All right. All right, there's a motion on the floor to award the student planners uh, bid to or award to entourage in the amount of 6,176 a year for three years. It's been seconded and no further discussion. Roll call on the approval for entourage, please. Ms. Vanello. Yes. Ms. Duby. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chavanel. Yes. Approval of letter for Medicaid billing services. Melissa. Okay. Um, so uh, the district uh, currently uses PCG and the contract is expiring on June 30th. Uh, we put out a uh, bid and it closed also on April 14th. We received two proposals. One was from CompuClaim and the second one was from uh, Public Consulting Group, which is PCG, the current vendor. Uh, both vendors uh, have reputable, um, uh, uh, are reputable providers within Rhode Island dis school districts. Um, upon the review of the proposals, I'm recommending that we use Public Consulting Group for a three-year contract with two optional one-year renewals. Uh, CompuClaim had a price of 6% um, with increases 6% um, for the first three years and 6.5% and 7 respectively for the two option years. PCG has committed to a flat price for the term of the first three years at 2.75% and in addition, 2.75% uh, for the two option renewals. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve. PCG for the vendor for Medicaid billing services by Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Mr. Lobby. Any discussion on this? 
Ms. Grant. Um, Mr. Vine, what do they actually bill for? And how, I, I know we get a reimbursement every year, but um, I, I'm just um, curious on how this works and why we would need them and what they bill for. So the revenue that's generated uh, each year is usually about 1.2 million. Uh, the piece that I work on is an administrative claim. And if you notice, um, there are two, um, there's direct services that um, are uh, services that are uh, provided to students and that are uh, Medicaid eligible. We have a contract with the um, state um, uh, Department of uh, Health Services and uh, what PCG does is files those claims for us. They're submitted by the special education department. Um, I would have to ask that the, um, the special education director could speak better to the types of services that they reimburse for. Um, man, uh, mainly my office just does the administrative part, which uh, references all, all of the staff that uh, perform the time studies in these services each quarter. But all in all, the revenue that's generated we call it revenue, but it's reimbursement. It's approximately 1.2 million. Okay, that's good, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else on the award to PCG? Roll call on the approval, please. Ms. Manolo. Yes. Ms. Dubey. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chavano. Yes. Thank you. All right, approval to obtain services of a spokesperson or firm to advise the Pawtucket School Committee. This is actually my agenda item. Um, I, I think that, uh, that this committee has done some extraordinary work over the last several years, and I don't, I don't know that we've done as good a job as we could have in getting that communication out to uh, the community. So I would ask that the committee think of and consider this um, as an opportunity to showcase some of the work we've done. You know, I, uh, Ms. Bonolo had asked previously to have some of the projects listed, and I think that email was, was sent out today. And really, it, it was, it's an impressive body of work over the last six years. Um, and but for this committee, I, I don't know that the you know, the community is aware of certainly some of the things we've done, but I don't know that they're aware of all $76 million worth of projects that have been completed over the last six years. So I, I put it on here as a, uh, as a discussion action item, and I, I, I would defer to the committee as to which way, if any, that uh, the committee wants to go with this. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve the authorization to go out for a spokesperson or firm to advise the Pawtucket School Committee by Ms. Grant, seconded by Mr. Marino. Discussion, Ms. Grant. Um, you know, I kind of want to tag on to what um, Chairman Chabonneau just stated. You know, we've been doing a lot of great work with the new buildings and things like that. And um, I do agree that we could get out there and communicate a lot better with the community. Um, but I also think um, this, is, this would be an opportunity for us to shine on the other things we have in our district. Um, you know, there are just so many good things going on in a lot of these schools. Unfortunately, I do realize we do have a pandemic, um, but if this was a typical school year, um, Shay would probably be doing their fashion show. Um, there would probably be some plays um, being done at the theater at JMW. Um, besides just, you know, some things at the elementary and middle school level. I believe Goff does some um, theater artwork also. Um, so I definitely think um, this will only help us. I, I do feel that the last few years, the communication um, has really lacked. Um, and I think this would probably be a great, a great way for us to um, get the community more involved. 
whether it's the individual schools or the district on a whole. Ms. Panalo. So I, I think I can use the rage end item. So thank you. Thank you for putting that on, Chairman Chavano. I think that's a, it's a great idea. Um, I think a few years back, they had looked into marketing, um, some information about Pawtucket when they were just beginning to um, look into renovations, but it never really went anywhere. Um, they had talked about film clips and things like that. But we have so much that's happened besides just green and Potter Burns and the showcase is going to be winters. But um, like Kim said, Ms. Grant said, the, the things that are happening in our schools, our children learning Chinese um, that they presented at the school committee meeting and they spoke you know, limited words, but they also spoke in Italian and they spoke in Portuguese, I believe. Um, things like that. Those are important things that highlight our district. Not that we're losing any people because we're not. Um, people still, our, our numbers haven't changed in heaven's knows a lot of years. I haven't seen it go below 8,000. Um, but I think people need to see exactly what Pawtucket's doing, Pawtucket schools are doing. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Lobby. Yeah, so um, I think it's definitely important that we find ways to better communicate all, all the good um, that is going on and, um, and everything else as well. Uh, I, I, will, I am a little concerned of potentially uh, how much this could potentially cost, but um, if the accident item and uh, and what we're going on is to explore those options, I um, I'm definitely for it, um, and then further discuss whether or not with the price point it, it would be a, a good um, way to spend um, the additional money. Um, the other thing I question I have is this uh, more terms that like so uh, you you mentioned the word advise i'm just trying to picture um what this um uh consulting group uh company may do is it, are we thinking more like a, a marketing firm that would um just handle all communication efforts or um is it just more of a like a consulting type of group that just uh, advises us on what we should be doing yeah i i think my my thought process was more on an advising, um, you know, it, it may be a little bit of both, but I, I think initially we want to be able to take some of our, um, some of those, those bigger issues and bring somebody in to, to showcase them. For, for example, the, the winter's groundbreaking, um, I didn't see anything about that other than what the committee members posted themselves on their social media outlets. And, and there was a bit of a, a blurb in, um, in the paper, but I think if we could have brought in a firm to say, what, how's the best way to, to communicate this out to the city? Um, and they would advise us that, you know what, maybe it's the local newspaper or maybe it's not, maybe it's, it's some kind of press release that's that's sent home with every student or so advise us on how best to communicate these these uh these projects and milestones within the in the district out to the community okay miss doobie and then miss grant um i i would um kind of echo what um stephen just said uh and and say that um I definitely think it's something to explore. Um, and I would love to know um, what is out there right now, especially for multilingual firms or firms that specifically understand cities. Um, I know that um, just from my work on the state board that other, other school committees have done similar work, but it's very different saying how you're going to, you know, communicate in Lincoln and um, Barrington to how you're gonna communicate in an urban setting. Um, so just the idea of thinking about how um, 
our families are going to best receive information and whether there are communication experts who work um, in at a city setting as opposed to kind of like a just a you know this is the general approach that works for everybody um and like i said that multilingual approach as well and how to best communicate i know like right now we send emails and it's like language 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 which is just good um but having ideas for um better reaching families i think is great i also think that um providence has a dedicated communication spokesperson that they pay a lot of money to um and so I wonder if that's the direction they're going to tell us we should be going in as a district as a whole. Um, so I think it's definitely worth exploring. All right. Ms. Grant. Um, actually, I was going to kind of say a little bit um, of what Ms. Juby said. Um, um, in regards to a spokesperson, I think it's great that if we have a company that does advise us, but I also think that if we are going to do this, then we really do need to take into consideration um, a particular person who's going to either it's a person who's already here or a position that we create for this information to get out there, because if it is going to be something um, I think we need to be consistent with it. Um, I, I don't think it should be from administration to administration, uh, meaning one particular administrator might feel comfortable reaching out to a particular reporter and one might not. So, you know, I think we have to kind of make sure we measure the pros and cons and that if it is someone internally that does is advised on how to do it that it consistently takes place and that it's not forgotten due to other responsibilities in their job being more important um you know um because i think this year um with the pandemic i think one of the things we have heard over and over um is is the lack of communication and it might be whether you know we discuss it more with our schools and they push more of updating the calendar on the website i don't even know if the calendar is still there but i know when my daughter went to protect schools if i wanted to know what was going on i would go to the calendar for her particular school on the the um the city's website. So I just think, you know, if we're going to do this and look into it, we have to explore all the options and then we have to make sure that there is carry through on it. All right. Um, in, in that case, I would, um, and Attorney Conley, maybe you can weigh in here. Am I in a position on approval of this to select two or three members to explore the different options or does does the approval of this allow me to work with you to explore different options and bring those options back to the committee you can craft the motion either way um it, it's really just a request to be able to obtain as i read it approval to obtain services of a spokesperson or firm to advise uh Pawtucket school committee it's really just about identifying the firm, right? So the manner in which you choose to identify the firm could be crafted within the motion. Um, I think under the OMA, that's perfectly clear. The only thing I will add is uh, when we do decide how we want to go about doing this, we need to do, take a serious look at what we're considering in terms of whether or not it's gonna be an RFP. Um, there may be some requirements that it's competitively bid depending on what we do. It may be the difference between uh, a consulting firm versus an employee, uh, an employment sort of position or a part-time employment position. They're, those are different options that we should probably discuss in terms of how we want to achieve what the goals are. Okay. Um, at, then I would ask that the committee approve me to select a, a subcommittee to, to review this and report back to the entire committee with their findings and recommendations as to how best to proceed. So moved. Second. 
So there was, somebody made an initial motion, Ms. Grant, I think if you can withdraw your initial motion to approve it, and then we can. Sure. Um, I remove my um, motion to Thanks. approve. And Mr. Marino there's, has made a motion to authorize me to establish a subcommittee to review obtaining services for a spokesperson or firm to advise the Pawtucket School Committee. That subcommittee will report back its findings and recommendations to the full school committee. Was there a second on Mr. Marino's motion? Yep, second. Seconded by Mr. Lobby. Any other discussion on this? Roll call on the approval, please. Ms. Bonolo. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Lobby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chavano. Yes. Thank you. And I know there's a lot going on. If anyone wants to um, participate, send me an email afterwards and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, approval of vendor for transportation. Ms. Doobie, are you taking this one? I mean, I can make a motion, but I think um, Melissa should present on, uh, you know, the who, who bid and our, our Lee could present who bid. Okay, we'll take your motion, Ms. Doobie, and then we'll... Um, I, I move to approve um, first student as the only bidding vendor. Second. Motion by Ms. Doobie to approve the award for vendor transportation of first student as the only bidding vendor, seconded by Ms. Grant. Discussion, Melissa or Assistant Superintendent Rabbit, who's... So I'll, I'll take that, um, Mr. Chairman. Sure. The, we placed an RFP out to bid. Um, it was sent directly to numerous companies. We actually, um, fortunately, we had Ms. Grant and Ms. Doobie to assist us on the committee. They did a great job. Um, and we actually extended our scope to include um, companies in Massachusetts. We did have some interest from two companies who did ask us questions. One of them asked us quite a few questions, but in the very end, we only had one bidder um, for this bid and it was First Student, who is our current company. All right, there's a motion on the floor to award the vendor transportation to First Student. It's been seconded. We're in discussion, Ms. Doobie. Um, I, I would definitely like um, Melissa or Lee to walk through the financial implications just for people who didn't look at the bid. I'd rather they do it because um, I know that they can give um, the very specific numbers. But I did want to highlight for the committee um, a few things that I saw um, that really, I mean, I know we only had one bid to look at, but that really made me um, excited to continue to partner with First Student. Um, one, they have really concrete methods that they spelled out for how they're going to eliminate their driver shortage. They, um, they really walked through, and I've even seen the billboards, billboards on the highway. They walked through um, uh, the social media posts they're putting out and how they've raised the wages um, and are providing comprehensive benefits and sick time to their employees, which um, I, I really like seeing. Um, in addition, um, they really highlight their first planning solutions with um, included in our package efficiency studies, um, route optimization, um, and scenario modeling, which I think especially as we are, I, and I'm, this is probably part of the package before, but I liked it spelled out because as we're thinking about, we're going to go to them, we're going to say, listen, we, um, you know, we want to know, is it possible for us to extend to high school busing next year? What does that look like? And they, it's part of the package that they sit down, they scenario, they plan it out. Um, and also I found that they highlighted five school districts nationwide as examples of how this works. And Pawtucket was one of them in, in their actual bid, Pawtucket's plan to shift to middle schools. They highlighted how they had worked through it with us. Um, and like I said, the other ones were like Oregon and um, so that was that was interesting to see. Um, so definitely in their interest to continue to provide those services and continue to have that um, good good word. Um, in addition, um, the technology that they're going to be adding, I believe, and Lee can clarify, but um, to be able for the parents to um, 
on smartphones be able to track where their kids bus is um, I think is really a lot of other districts I think do have this now and it's really helpful um, and also it helps us with ridership because there will be these um, tablets where the um, when the kids come on they can clearly mark who's there and it really helps with um, making sure there's never a kid left behind on the bus because it's really it's like it's right there who came on and um, it's day-to-day -day monitoring as opposed to you know having to like pull studies to figure out how many kids are riding buses so I liked all that um, I do have a couple questions um, the first one is is the cancellation due to like pandemic language and this could be legal or Melissa or Lee is this just now how bus contracts are all going to read like they all kind of got caught with with COVID but now they're like yeah this is going to go in all of our contracts now I would say it's pandemic related but again we we still even after first student it's approved we have to come up with the contract agreement as we normally do and I'm sure that Melissa, you went on mute. Sorry. Um, so, so I believe that once we get a draft uh, of the contract uh, from first student, we'll be handing that over to legal, and I'm sure that they'll advise us on what's best to keep into the in the contract and not in the contract. I know that last time, um, again pre-COVID, we had language that actually allowed us to um, move in the direction that we did. So I, I would think that they're putting it everywhere. So, um, so I, I did see that. Um, my second um, is more as a statewide push. I'm, I'd love to see, because this can't be done district by district, but first student presented at the National School Board Association, their push to use electric buses. Um, they are contracting out countrywide to do this. They have the capacity but the state has to get behind it and actually build the charging stations. And, um, but they really highlighted how great it is to have these quieter buses um, and, and how they can do it with very little extra cost for the district. So I do hope that our state um, looks to unify behind that because it really has to be more of a unified approach. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to highlight is between the parent app and this first feedback where parents can actually just say like, you know, my bus was late. Um, my bus driver seemed to be yelling at the kids, you know, like whatever it is, like that they can actually just, you know, send that feedback over really quickly. I really hope that when we roll out our buses this year, we can clearly communicate to parents all of these new opportunities for them to be engaged with their transportation provider. Um, because I hate, like, similar with the planners, if it's in there, I hope we're really taking advantage of it to its fullest potential and telling parents that this is your way to have a voice and really have us have the best transportation available. So I, I mean, I support the first student and I was excited about some of the things I saw in this proposal. Anything else on the approval for first student? I would, I would just, comment and you know it i mean we we received one bid so it it is what it is as they say but my experience with first student has been somewhat to the extent that they over promise and under deliver um and i i i hope that that's not the case but lee i don't know if the i i recall not too long ago perhaps a year um, when we were looking to get some some on time records from them that took four or five months for them to deliver them to us um, so I get that we can put a, a bid package together that shows all these wonderful um, add-ons but if we can't deliver them for our for our families it's it's a lot about nothing in, in my eyes. And I, I just hope that we're able to, to keep on pace with these things because like I said, my experience with them hasn't, uh, hasn't always been that they've delivered what they said they would. 
So I think. Oh, go ahead, Miss Rabbit. It's all right, Miss Spinola. You're muted, Miss Spinola. Okay, I have a question. I'm not sure who can answer this, but when I was looking through it, and I didn't. I don't have it in front of me now, but it had the scan option, which was included in the bottom pricing. And I know you, um, Aaron had alluded to that. What are they scanning? So we wouldn't be using the scan option. The option we would be using is in order currently, every time a student gets on the bus, their attendance is taken, but it's taken in paper. And so in order for us to say, is that student on the bus? It requires, and you know, bus drivers are not allowed to use a cell phone. So it requires going back and forth on the two way um, in order to find out who is on the bus, who got dropped off. The new tablets that Ms. Duby discussed will track the attendance electronically. Therefore, it will be able to be relayed back to the depot and back to us. So who will do that? The bus driver or the monitor? The monitor. Okay. Thank you. And Lee, do we have access to that on our network or is that something? We will. We will called you, you we could log in and see? We don't currently have it, but we have requested it. But the other tool that we also requested, which we have seen previewed and have seen it in other districts, is the ability to see the buses in real time. So we would have the ability to see where a bus is and we would have the ability to see what time it gets to every stop if you know and see that in real time currently only for students sees that and as so you mentioned it was very frustrating at times getting those records with this new software parents would also have that ability to see where their bus is and what time it gets to their stop okay. miss doobie yeah, and I definitely echo your frustration. And um, as I expressed when um, with Ms. Grant and Ms. Rabbit, when we, um, you know, kind of talked about these, um, uh, that, you know, you open this and you're like, wow, these guys look great. Let's use them. And you're like, oh, they're our current vendor. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but I really do think that at this point, if we go with this and this new enhanced package, it really, the onus is on us to make sure that we're using it. So if what they're saying is your parents, like I said, their first feedback is one of the, um, one of the included elements. Um, someone can shake their head. No, if that's not what we're including, but this first feedback where parents can actually say like, you know, my bus was late or, you know, it didn't seem like my kid was really comfortable on the bus, like anything like that, which can help us better say, listen, we're getting all this feedback on bus 32. Um, Parents keep on saying that it's, you know, and then, but like Lee said, we can also, we don't have to wait for the reports. We can see it ourselves every day. Um, and so I think it's on us now to make sure we communicate it to the parents that they use these resources, but also that we use them um, to really say like, you need to deliver. Right. So, so long as, as we, I, and I think it's great, as long as we have real time access to the data, and we don't have to request the f parent feedback from for a student because I think sometimes that's where the the disconnect is a bit. Miss Panola, you have something else on this? I just have a question, and maybe it's been discussed before. Do we have seatbelts on our buses? Nope. Yeah, we do not have seatbelts on our buses. There are certain children that ride in harnesses. Our pre-K students ride in harnesses and certain special education students ride in a harness, but there are not seatbelts on buses in Rhode Island. Not required. Okay, thank you. All right, there being no further discussion, there's a motion on the floor to award the transportation contract to first student. It's been seconded. Roll call on the approval, please. Ms. Vidalo. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chauvino. Yes. All right. First, can we let in uh, Jared and Holly, Gianna? I will. 
All right, we're going to move to approval to award for hazardous building material inspection, testing, design, and abatement, remediation, monitoring services for Charles E. Shea High School. I think Jared is taking this one. We'll let him get logged in. I believe everybody's coming in now. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? This is Gianna. Hey, Gianna. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone, again. So the Pawtucket School Department is in receipt of two bids for the Hazardous Building Materials Abatement Consulting Services to be completed at Shea High School. And based on the amount of the bids, Collier's recommends that Pawtucket School Department accept the bid for Environmental Consulting and Management, ECM, of Riverside, Rhode Island, and the amount of 66400 and that's based upon the unit cost of the anticipated samples uh, required for this project. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve the award for hazardous material building inspection, testing, design, and abatement to ECM in the amount of $66,400 by Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Mr. Marino. Discussion on this. Gianna, is this one of those bids where depending on their findings, they could come back to us with a request for a change order or to add scope? Uh, this, this is correct, Chair, Mr. Chairman, yes. So we have uh, like uh, determined the specific number of samples required based on the scope of work for this project, uh, for this services. And uh, we may need less and we may need a couple more. So that depends on the finding of the actual samples. So they may require more samples and they may require less, as I mentioned. Okay. We seem to never have any firm that requires less, but uh, <laughs> he is hoping they, they'll be the first. All right. Anything else on the award for ECM, Ms. Bonolo? Um, will we be getting a timeline of when everything's happening? Um, Remember how we used to get the timeline from Collier's, the dated timeline? Is that when, the, was that the bar graph kind of scheduling that they put out? Yeah. yeah I'm sure. Um, Gianna, can you take that back as a takeaway that, uh, an, or, or Megan, an updated um, kind of flow schedule for Shea? Sure. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I can jump in on that. We're actually having our first kickoff call with Dimio tomorrow regarding our Shea project. And one of the, the points of discussion were to talk about the overall schedule. So once we connect with them, which we're going to start with them for the first half hour and then introduce our architectural firms. So to gather all the troops and then after that conversation, we can certainly put together a timeline for the overall project and distribute it to everyone. Perfect. All right, anything else on the award for ECM? Roll call on the approval, please. Ms. Spinolo. Yes. Ms. Duby. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chabonneau. Yes. All right, recommendation to award RTAs for Gilbane Winters Elementary School, RTA 026 Audiovisual Communications and Security. Good evening, thank you for having me. Um, hi guys. Um, yes, RTA 26, uh, it is a recommendation of Collier's to award the Audiovisual Communications and Securities Package to Rossi Electric Co. Inc. of Cranston, Rhode Island in the amount of uh, $826,000. Motion to approve. Motion to approve RTA 026 audio, uh, I'm sorry, is it 027, 026? 026, uh, it's 27A is the division. To Rossi in the amount of $826,000 by Ms. Bonolo, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Marino, discussion on this? Um, or maybe this is a question. Hirsch, you're on, correct? Hirsch? Yes, I am. Yes, I am, Chair. Um, is this, were you, were you involved in 
in the review of this or or have you looked at this does from a from an IT perspective i mean if we're going to spend $826,000 are we are we able to make the best use of this equipment that we I didn't, I didn't get to see the actual proposal that was there we did have some meetings about some other things but i didn't actually get to see that one proposal okay um then that that would be my comment going forward that when we when we look at major awards like this for a specified or or specialized i should say um we should bring our folks um that are experts in-house into the conversation um i would feel a lot better spending a hundred uh eight hundred and twenty six thousand dollars knowing that mr cristino had reviewed it in and uh you know and it's in line with what we're doing as a district and and we have the capabilities there to to be able to use all the the equipment of course yeah that that makes complete sense um i guess i would say that uh, the proposal that was presented here is uh, based off of the construction documents that we've been working off of um and i i i know that we've got some further work to do but uh, i think the construction documents are are pretty solid and giving the building what what we're looking for hopefully perfect miss panola you wanted to add something um, just wondering if we have the leeway of voting on that in two weeks when we have a regular meeting. Um, I am not 100% sure on that. Uh, I think that a lot of the equipment that we're looking to order on this is somewhat time sensitive. Um, and I, I, I agree with you, Ms. Bonolo. I, I, do, I do also recognize the fact that you know, we, we've also retained colliers and their expertise to, to advise us on these, these larger bids and projects as we go. So I, I'm comfortable accepting colliers recommendation for Rossi and 826,000, but with that caveat that going forward on a specialized item like this, I would, I would prefer or appreciate that uh, our in-house experts are uh, brought into the conversation as well of course and Mr. i mean are you, are you agreeable with that all right all right there's a motion on the floor to approve rta 026 to rossi in the amount of eight hundred and twenty six thousand dollars it's been seconded any further discussion roll call on the approval please miss Vanolo. yes miss juvie yes miss grant Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Shabano. Yes. All right. RTA 027. Jared, are you taking all three of these? Yes, I am. All right. You're up. R RTA 027. Uh, it is a recommendation of Colliers to award the interior framing and drywall package to H. Carr and Sons, Inc. of Providence, Rhode Island in the amount of $2,185,000. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve the interior framing and drywall to H. Carson Inc. in the amount of two million one hundred eighty-five thousand by Miss Panolo. Seconded by Mr. Marino. Discussion on this. Jared, just from a a bidding perspective, the I've seen H. Carr and Son's name a few times already early on in the project. Are we not able to, to package these individual RTAs into one larger one and get a better price seeing as they're, they're on site doing multiple portions of the project? So that is something that's actually been discussed. Um, and a lot of these bids are as competitive as, competitive as they are. Um, due to the fact that they're already kind of working some of that into it. Um, if in order, we're trying to get the most competitive bids that we can. So instead of packaging all of this into one bid and then getting a number from a couple different contractors, we're splitting it up. And um, H. Carr and Sons does just happen to be the lowest bidder on a lot of this. And I think that is partially 
due to the fact that they're getting other stuff. So they know that they're already on site and they can, their numbers can start coming in a little lower. All right. And my, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the firm, but I'm, they have the capacity to be able to take on multiple layers of this project. And yes. There's going to be some overlap, right? Um, there will probably be some overlap. Yes. They'll also have separate teams of people. Uh, they, they have a lot, uh, a larger uh, capability. So they have different teams of people that have different specialties that will come in. There will be a little bit of overlap. Yes. Okay. Anything else on RTA 027 interior framing and drywall? All right, there's a motion on the floor to make the award to H. Carr and Son in the amount of 2,185,000. It's been seconded. No further discussion. Roll call on the approval, please. Ms. Bonello. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chabonneau. Yes. All right. Last one, Jared. 028. RTA 28. It is the recommendation of Colliers to award the gym equipment package to Robert H. Lord Company of Manchester, Connecticut in the amount of $77,840. Motion to approve. Motion to approve the Jim Equipment Award RTA 028 to Robert Lord and Company in the amount of $77,840 by Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Mr. Marino. Discussion on this. Jared, the one thing, the one comment I have on this is it didn't appear in the document like we were getting a whole bunch for 77,000 bucks. I saw basketball equipment and wall matting. It does include basketball equipment, includes the wall mats, and it does include a scoreboard as well. Um, so it is a smaller bid, but it's more of a specialty bid, uh, which is why this was separated out from some of the other bids that it could have been lumped in with. But I, I, I guess my comment is bas two basket, I'm assuming it's two basketball hoops, one on either end, and then mats that are... That are Surrounding the gym along the wall, yes. Right. And, and uh, that comes to $77,000? There is also a divider curtain, and um, we are accepting one of the alternates that will uh, include a curtain at the stage. OK. So it, 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 there, there are a few other pieces to it. Um, the scoreboard is a relatively large piece as well. Um, All right. Mr. Marino. Was the other firm who it a um root 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 island firm? Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head because they did not include uh, the location in their bid breakdown, um, and they did not provide me with their uh, detailed breakdown. Um, but I can look into that and get back to you guys if you would like. And I think Lord, Lord actually came in at a lower price with the al alternate added to than the other firm came in on a base bid, if yes. memory serves me correct. Okay. Yes. Anything else on the gym equipment? It looks like the Pappas company is based out of Massachusetts. Watertown, it says. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, Megan. So there's a motion on the floor to award the gym equipment RTA to Robert Lord in the amount of 78,840. It's been seconded. No further discussion. Roll call on the approval, please. Ms. Bonolo. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Lobby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Mr. Chabonneau. Yes. All right, we are in uh, to discussion items. Presentation of timeline and tools for the superintendent evaluation. Ms. Dubia, are you gonna kick this off for us? Um, yeah, so I just want to um, remind the committee slash, I, I don't know if Stephen and Roberta were on um, when we uh, went over this um, a few years ago, but we passed a policy as a committee that we would have an annual superintendent evaluation. 
Um, and that hasn't happened. Um, we, because we changed superintendents and then COVID happened, we just, we, we aren't on a schedule that puts it so that it's just part of the annual business that our committee does. And it hasn't been for the entire six years that I've been on the committee. Um, we are by no means the only committee in the state that suffers from this problem, but definitely it's something that is part of our duties um, as part of um, Section 16 to have an annual evaluation. Um, so our policy spells out that um, we should be doing this annually. And I think that the most effective way to make sure it happens is to have a very clear timeline. And basically every single April, this is what we do. We, we say, okay, here's the tool. Here's a reminder of the timeline, especially since our committee changes form every two years. Um, so building this discussion into the um, timeline so that newer members can ask questions um, and also um, understand the tool that will be used. Um, so I think the superintendent can take it from here to talk about um, a tool that um, as part of um, the superintendent's association, she's um, better able to speak to the superintendent um, standards that are used to evaluate superintendents. And also, um, um, I spoke with Dr. McWilliams and um, she had a great idea for how that timeline could work going forward. And like I said, it's now up to us as a committee and future iterations of the committee to keep it just like we keep the budget as part of our yearly business to make sure that we perform this. So that's just the introduction. Um, Dr. McWilliams? Yes, thank you Deputy Chair and thank you Chairman Chabano. Greetings to all of you. I am pleased to be able to share this with you. I do have a short presentation, so I hope you will um, be uh, happy to see it. I'm gonna open it up and share my screen right now. Um, what I'd like to say is that when we, when we talk about evaluation, as uh, Deputy Chair just stated, it's grounded in the policy and it's also grounded in our strategic plan. So those are the two important um, pieces when we talk about a grant, uh, evaluation. And the, and the next thing is when we talk about evaluation, you know, people could say, well, why? What is that? What, what, why is that important? And, and I know why it's important to me, and that's what I would like to share with you, because I really do believe that leadership matters, that um, you know, being ahead of a school department matters as a leader, and we all can um, learn how we are doing and how we can make improvements and how we can make things better. And um, additionally, as a head of a school department, a superintendent does evaluate others. And so it's really uh, critical that if the head is going to evaluate others, that there's an evaluation process um, for the superintendent as well. One of my favorite um, uh, leadership quotes is that leadership is only second to the classroom instruction among all school related factors that will contribute to how well students do in school. And when we talk about um, particularly leadership and leading in an urban school. These are some foundational research studies that I reviewed um, that really talk about leading in urban districts, leading in, uh, in trying to improve schools that are struggling and also transforming schools. And these are from the Wallace Foundation and also from the Harvard Educational Press. They're, they're very um, well-known, renowned, uh, educational research papers. Uh, the last one is a book. Um, and I think it's important to you know, realize that we, what we're doing is grounded in research. When we talk about making any kind of um, improvements or an evaluation, it should always be grounded in research. And then uh, some of the other things that are important that are, are gonna, I'm going to be reviewing is the Code of Professional um, Responsibilities for Educators. So this is for all of our educational leaders that our responsibility is to our students, our responsibility is to ourselves, and to be committed to high professional standards. Um, our responsibility is, is to our colleagues and, and to the profession and to our parents and community and to the Rhode Island Department of Education. That's part of the Rhode Island Department of Education's responsibility standards. And then you have the standards for educational leaders 
Uh, these were adopted by the Rhode Island Department of Education in 2016, uh, reviewed again in 2018. And you can see them there. Standard one is mission, vision, and core values. Standard two is ethics and professional responsibility. Standard three is equity and cultural responsiveness. Standard four, curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Standard five, community of care and support for students. Standard six, professional capacity of school personnel. Standard seven, professional community for teachers and staff. Standard eight, meaningful engagement of families and community. Standard nine, operations and management. And standard 10, school improvement. So those are the Rhode Island educational leader standards that they adopted from this national education leadership standards, which is what is used in all educational leaders um, pre-prep programs. And you can see as you look at them that they group seven, three of the Rhode Island ones are actually spelled out more clearly, whereas in the national ones they're grouped together. So the first one for the national is continuous improvement. So that would be using um, your school improvement, which, which is actually number 10 in the Rhode Island standards, and your uh, vision, mission, and goals. And then number two, ethics and professional norms, which is the same as Rhode Island. Number two, equity and cultural responsiveness, the same. Instructional leadership, curriculum, instruction, assessment, and accountability. Community engagement and building community of care. So they lump the uh, community engagement and building of student community and care together into two. Um, and then developing professional capacity in policy, governance, management, and operations. So these are the standards upon which um, a superintendent is evaluated. And it's important also that standards, um, along with the standards, which we align our district strategic plan to, that any evaluation incorporates what we are doing locally as a district. So these are our priorities that we have. Uh, we have a team working on our strategic plan. Uh, we are in the process of redoing it as RIDE is redoing their um, state plan. And, but the four priorities have remained consistent over this year. So, but the four priorities being strong foundations. And as, as I read some of the areas of what that would be, you can see how it aligns to those standards. So strong foundations is being grounded with a strong curriculum, high quality curriculum instruction and assessment and accountability system. Also grounded in social emotional welfare of students grounded in early childhood, and then shares responsibilities is grounded in um, leadership and leadership capacity, building uh, talent development, that's your professional development. It also includes climate and culture. And then globally competent citizens is the CTE pathways, um, creating and enhancing our CTE pathways, advancing coursework, your dual enrollment, and then systems improvement is what we talked a lot about tonight is your facilities and looking at your um, facilities, but also data management and your financial systems and your things like your budget. So those are the main four priorities of um, what we have adopted at this point for our um, district strategic plan. There'll be much more detail and goals um, as I talk about this timeline. So right now we are in April. April and like Deputy Chair shared, each April we want to review uh, what these standards and keep them fresh in our mind and also um, the schedule. So the schedule would be this review that falls in April and then May. Um, now we didn't start this last year, but um, you know I would I would still be planning on doing this this May is just doing like a, re a year in the review. So taking um, a review of our annual progress. But next May, we will be looking more specifically of the annual progress that's aligned to the goals. And then in um, August, what is this August will be a, our strategic plan that we'll be sharing out with you and the goals that go along those actual action steps that are measurable that will go along with the strategic plan. And then throughout the months of September through March, we would have check-in meetings um, that would be with whoever the chair um, decides um, that, that that would fall to. Um, check-in meetings given an opportunity to go over progress and how things are going. And then June, which would be June of 2022, would be the uh, formal evaluation by the school committee done in executive session. So that's the timeline. 
I would like to go through um, specifically just to give it a better understanding of the standards and what they mean. So um, these are taking the standards, the national criteria and, um, and which align to the Rhode Island standards and also align to our particular um, strategic plan. So standard one, visionary in district leadership. So this would include things like creating a strategic plan, uh, vision and mission, or reaffirming it um, and uh, reviewing that each year. Usually a strategic plan does go over a three year period, but obviously you walk through that year and you make adjustments as needed based on how you were doing. Um, setting and leading a diverse stakeholders involvement in the district plan and um, making improvements and communicating its progress. Standard one, standard two is ethics and professional norms. So this is um, ensuring ethical decisions um, are being made and cultivating professional norms, um, including culture and equity, integrity, transparency, trust, collaboration, and perseverance, making ethical and legal recommendations to the board, um, modeling ethical behavior and conduct and cultivating ethical behavior in others, developing a proposed budget. So you'll see when I talked about the priorities that budget falls in the fourth priority, which is systems improvement, but um, it also falls under this because a proposed budget should uh, be ethical. So that's why you'll see that there. Managing equitable implementation of all the district's resources and communicating the budget priorities and ensuring regular updates. So that's standard two. Standard three, an inclusive district culture. So developing and maintaining a supportive and equitable, culturally responsive and inclusive um, uh, culture in our schools, evaluating and advocating for equitable access with the safe nurturing schools, ensuring equitable, inclusive, and culturally responsive instructional and behavioral supports in our schools, among our teachers, our administration, and all of our staff. The end four, instructional leadership and accountability. So this is, sorry, just, okay. This is evaluating and designing, fostering, and implementing coherent systems of our resources, that's in, um, integrated tiered systems of support, assessment and instructional leadership for statewide accountability, implementing coordinated systems of support, including coaching and professional development for all staff, managing an appropriate system of assessments, data collection and analysis that supports our instructional improvements, equity, student learning and well-being. Ensuring instruction throughout the district utilizes culturally responsive and trauma-informed practices and promotes staff training. Standard five, communication and community relations. Developing an, and I, we spoke to this quite a bit tonight, so I'm sure you're um, pleased to see this. Develop and implement an effective and collaborative system that engages multiple and diverse stakeholders in the group engages and effectively communicates with diverse families, community partners, and other constituencies to strengthen student learning, cultivate relationships and partnerships with members of the business, civic and faith-based um, community for support of advocacy for the district, school and community needs, and then uh, going beyond and above the local state and community to advocate for our students in the country, state, or region. Standard six, Effective organizational management is implementing equitable strategies, processes, and systems to recruit, hire, develop, and retain high-performing, diverse personnel who demonstrate a shared commitment to student success, establish productive relationships with associations while managing labor relations and contracts effectively, creating and maintaining organizational structures that maximize the district's capacity to positively impact student learning, create a comprehensive system of professional development for all staff to continuously improve and increase in their leadership capacity. Standard seven, policy and governance and advocacy. So this is developing relationships, leading collaborative decision-making, governing. Um, the word governing is very similar you would hear in the business world as like managing, uh, representing and being an advocate for the district in local country and state policy conversations cultivating a respect and responsive relationship with the school committee focused on achieving the shared mission and vision of the district, 
implement, maintain, and communicate the district, state, and national policies, laws, rules, and regulations to staff, board, and other appropriate stakeholders. So those are the standards upon which, let me just stop sharing here so I can go back and see you all, um, upon um, which uh, the evaluation should be based along with goals that are set from the strategic plan and then any um, personal, often, oftentimes is optional personal goals of a superintendent. So that is my presentation. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Um, so thank you, Dr. McWilliams, for um, sharing that. Um, I, um, I had talked to Dr. McWilliams, like I said, about that timeline, and I just want to spell it out um, just for this committee how this would um, look going forward. Like I said, this would happen every April for whatever iteration, whatever you know, makeup the committee is. Um, it would be a review of those standards. Those are the exact standards that we would then use in June to meet an executive session to discuss based on those standards and the strategic plan, how do we feel our superintendent is meeting each of those indicators? So um, Dr. McWilliams clearly spelled out like under each standard, there's clear indicators. And it's really important um, as I talk to other districts about what they're doing, a lot of them said, we don't have clear standards and it kind of just becomes like us just talking generally like, oh, we kind of like this or we kind of don't like that. And that's really not the best practice. We really want to make sure we have clear standards that we're using as um, benchmarks. Um, and like I said, and that happens in executive session. And then we let our superintendent know how how we as a committee feel about progress and what we would want to see going forward. This is extremely important because of the legislative changes where our biggest decision now, our really our only hiring decision is our superintendent. You know, we're not approving principals. So it's very important, more important than ever that we have this in place. Our policy does say that that evaluation is based on the goals that were set the year before. So that's why this year we will be jumping over that June because we can't like it's it we can't retroactively go back a year and say okay but we want to pretend we started this a year ago um so in august um and every august going forward the superintendent will present and say here's what i'm planning to do this year and then the following april we'll meet again we'll have a review of all this a review of this tool and then we will meet as a committee and use that tool to evaluate the, basically the school year 2021 to 2022 and i thought it was really important that we do this put this on the school calendar but also on our renewal of contract um where um dr mcwilliams identified that her contract ends at the end of um june so it's am i correct on that um do you are you talking about personal contract yes oh it's june 2023 yeah. So, so, but that, it, and that like, it's always kind of going off of the end of the school year, end of um, the, you know, that when we consider renewal as well um, in future years. Um, so yeah, so um, just uh, this April meeting would never be a discussion of actual performance because it's an open session. And, but then the next one at the bottom at the um, timeline did spell out that that would be always executive session as spelled out in our policy. Um, I have a question. Um, in this dream, maybe you can answer it or Chairman Chabano. Um, actually, it's kind of like a two potter. So what you're saying is this year we're not we're not going to evaluate her for 2021. Her, am I correct or? There will not be an evaluation this year. It'll be done for next year. Yeah, our, uh, sorry, Chair, um, Chair um, our policy does say it would be based on basically this year long arc. So we could say, you know, going back, we're gonna use these, you know, metrics that were kind of put in like place as goals, but we haven't been doing this formally. Um, and okay. like I said, it's, the nature of us not having a clear calendar of how we were going to do it. It has to be an annual process where goals are set and then we evaluate based on those goals and metrics. So 
I also believe the superintendent's contract states that if we are not going to renew her contract, we have to give her so much time. So if we are going to renew, um, review her next April or June or whenever, wouldn't that be too late if we decided at that time that she was not the right person for the position? And then we would have to wait another initial year. This is just in that case. Um, because to be honest with you, I, I am very concerned um, about us pushing this back. And the reason is, is I was on the school committee when this came into place. And I did come back after, when we as a committee put this in place. Um, the first year after we put it in place, Obviously, it didn't take it didn't take place with the previous superintendent, and then um, we had a temporary superintendent, which is fine. And then she was hired right before the school year. So Superintendent McWilliams has been in the position since the school year starting of twenty eighteen, if I'm correct. When when did Ms. Desenzo stop? um retire please correct me was that 2019 she, the summer june of 19 oh, um i apologize so um right before the school year of 2019 um superintendent mcwilliams had started so we haven't done an evaluation or anything on her um since she's begun and now we're going to not do anything until 20 2022 and it'll also be after the fact if we have to if we want to notice her i'm not saying we're going to do that but you would think the evaluation would play into that and that's very concerning uh yeah miss grant i i think two things one i share your and I, i'll ask attorney conley to to look at that um, because I share your, your timing with the evaluation needs, if the contract has an automatic option year or automatic role, then the evaluation has to take place sometime prior to that automatic role. Exactly. Otherwise, you know, five, 10 years from now, there could be a different committee evaluating a superintendent and say, you know what? He's not the right person for the job, but the evaluation came after they've tacked on a second year or third year to the contract. So I think we gotta, we gotta align the evaluation with the automatic role of the contract as we go forward. But I- And I, I do apologize, um, Dr. McWilliams, for using you. I didn't think of future ones. I just, I just know in this case, we're, we're speaking of you. So that's why I just no, used okay. you. I just I, wanted to, and I that's think, the only reason I used But I, I, I agree that if, that it was left for this body to conduct the evaluations and the fact that we haven't to now try and almost go backwards a bit and try and put together an evaluation based off of um, maybe not recent you know, without having this presentation ahead of time, I, I don't know that that's the right option either. I think we needed a clear starting point. I think tonight does that. I think we have a process that we can follow and a timeline that we can follow. I think there's some tweaking that we have to do to make sure it aligns to everything else we're doing. Um, but beyond that, I think it was incumbent on us as a committee to start this six years ago and we never kind of got out of the starting blocks. But that's my take on it. Ms. Panolo? Right. In, oh, um, go ahead. Oh, and, and, and I appreciate that. And, and I understand that. But I do think that there has been a lot going on. Um, I oh, you froze, Ms. Grant. All 
right. Miss Grant appears like she's frozen. Miss Bonolo, do you want to go? And if Miss Grant. Very important. Uh -huh. Miss Grant. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm we didn't sorry. catch anything you said at the uh, beginning. I'm sorry. Um, you know, and I understand that. Um, but I do feel that, you know, and this is just my, um, you know, my own feeling. But I feel that either we need to do an interim or something this year. And reason being is, I feel that this year was a very different year for everyone. And I think um, just us as a district, you know, um, we were, um, I, I think parents, parents expect, I believe, this year for us to answer for last year. And I think us as a committee, we've always said that we're being told and shared that our district is excelling in district learning. And I think it's very important for us to remember that because if our numbers come in bad in the fall, you know, we're not gonna look very good. And we've been kind of, you know, I think if we, we maintain or we do better, I think we should definitely applaud and give credit where credit's due. But if not, then I think, you know, at that point, we really need to work on and um, kind of do maybe an interim to speak to the administration in regards to um, this could happen again next year, you know? Um, but, but I think we need to own this past year. And like I said, it's just my opinion, but I, I just think we've, we've let it, and not just in the case of um, Dr. McWilliams, but I think just in the case of, um, you know, even the previous superintendent, we've kind of let it, let it kind of drop by the wayside. And I think we need to do something to kind of um, bring it forward, um, whether it be an interim or not. I just think to wait a whole almost other year, I, I think it's kind of like saying that, you know, this last year didn't really matter, you know, and it just concerns me what the perception could be, you know, and I, I, I feel that we owe it to our district, the community, and the students to, um, you know, just, just high, hold our administration to high standards, like we should expect from ourselves. So that's all I have to say, and that's, you know, I just wanted to just kind of say that. So thank you. Ms. Panolo? Um, given that the information that we've been provided is um, long um, and intricate, are we going to build a rubric off that and weight it as far as what we feel is important? Um, because we have lines of information, but we have no base to um, rate it. Is it just going to be a conversation? Um, is it going to be like we do with our, our vendors? We do a rubric on them. Um, yeah, I, how will we, because if we're doing something like that, then we need prep work prior to. So, which is why I'm bringing it up now. Right, and Ms. Duby, maybe you can speak to uh, how the policy lays it out, if it yeah. does. And so, Ms. Vanolo, this is the this is the prep work. That's why this April meeting happens, so that you could ask a question like, "I'm unclear on that indicator." Um, and you know, when you say collaborative, there, what what does that mean? Um, and to to Ms. Grant's point, I I really have to echo what what the chairman said that. This is our our policy says this is verbatim. The committee will provide a yearly performance evaluation of the superintendent. The evaluation will be based upon goals presented by the superintendent at the beginning of the school year. These goals will have measurable results. At the end of the school year, the superintendent will present a comprehensive review of progress made to meet these goals. Um, and then all meetings in which the superintendent's evaluation discussion will be held in executive session. 
So we then meet, and based on the results of the evaluation process, the committee shall compile a yearly report informing the community. Um, and I think that, um, as Dr. McWilliams spelled out, those this does not mean that we as a committee cannot informally check in with our superintendent and give direction. But I think it's kind of exactly as you indicated, like gut feeling like this year has been different. You know, I think we need to like look to X, Y, or Z. That's exactly why I feel like standards are so key because, you know, we need to actually look at what are the standards of excellent leadership and how do we feel our superintendent is meeting them and they apply during a pandemic or not during a pandemic but um and we have to just balance them all evenly and then provide that report to our superintendent and like i said this is us as a committee not following through but this is how we get right with that and start this process and i definitely think that informing about our progress all throughout the year those are the types of things that were highlighted in those standards communication with stakeholders so it is on our superintendent to be informing our community after the ricast results come out and and accounting for these elements um and at that August meeting, when this process starts, we will have clear guidelines of what our superintendent, who we have hired, is saying she wants to do for the upcoming school year. And throughout the year, we will see progress on those measurable goals. And then at the end, we will say, okay, how did we do for the year? But kind of like going back and saying, well, we really wish there had been a goal weather the pandemic really well, um, you know, and how did how did we do during that? I just don't think that's how you evaluate people. I think it's really important to have the standards set in advance. Um, but that's how I feel. And like I said, that's why I wanted to make sure this was a discussion item so that we could ask questions about it. All right. Anything else on this? Ms. Panolo. So I understand what Ms. Grant's saying, and I agree. We have to, especially in light of the pandemic, we have to either give our approval or disapproval of the superintendent. And I think not, not by the standards that we have going forward, but I think it needs to be a discussion that um, yes, we approve of what she's done. Um, if there's anything glaring that someone sees that they think we should look at going forward, that should be brought together. But I think it should just, we should at least have the conversation um, why there's no, why there's a renewal. We're renewing her contract. It's not until 2023 but we have to agree that we want her where she is so is it do nothing or or well i i think a couple of things i one i think if if we're gonna we either have a policy and we stick to it or we don't and i think if we start to get off track and say maybe we're going to have a kind of off the record or or on the record conversation five months from now i think we potentially run into some contractual issues because let's not forget the superintendent is a contracted employer with a pretty specific employment contract with us so doing things that would be out of that realm i think open us up down the road to to issues of of contract litigation um so i think this committee um or the majority of this committee was involved in establishing a policy that indicated the timeline that is those kind of things that the superintendent reviewed with us today and i think listen and as chairman i will take full responsibility for the fact that we never once 
re-evaluated Superintendent Desenzo. And in two years, we haven't yet evaluated Superintendent McWilliams. And that falls on me as the chair to bring this forward. And, you know, so to Ms. Doobie's point, I think we have to level set. I think that's what tonight is about. And that shows a clear pathway forward. But I would, I would caution the committee about looking at options to have some kind of informal assessment or evaluation um, that doesn't align with either our policy or the superintendent's employment contract. Anything else on this? Ms. Doobie? I would just like to thank Dr. McWilliams because um, this is like I said, this is um, us setting the record straight for our committee. Um, but I really appreciate that Dr. McWilliams did the digging to get the standards spelled out clearly um, because um, that's really helpful. And then um, worked over that timeline. I would like um, our council to weigh in and look at the contract language on whether, like I said, I we backdated to that early June, but if it has to happen in May, that would still be our contract says at the end of the school year. I mean, I'm sorry, our policy says at the end of the school year. So I think that could be interpreted as May or June. So if we need to like, as Ms. Grant said, put five weeks or six weeks, whatever it is, um, before that um, evaluation, um, that I think that that's important but that we generally follow this procedure moving forward at infinite, you know, just going into the future. Ms. Pinello. Will it be possible to have a finalization on the dating, um, Mr. Conley, by say the next meeting? When's the next meeting? A couple weeks. No problem. And Thank just you. a reminder, this isn't an approval. This is just a discussion item, so. Right, but yeah. it'd be nice to see the correct dating and that way we can go forward. Anything else on this? All right, there being no um, other discussion. Actually, uh, Chairman Chabano. I just wanna say something. Uh, you know, I wanna thank you too, Dr. McWilliams. It, you know, um, I don't want to compare you to my 13-year-old daughter, but it, I find that it's very difficult for her when we go to the doctors and, you know, we kind of talk around them. And I, I think that's exactly what it was tonight. You know, it is about you and your evaluation and um, how you do work. And I think, it, you know, you know, I apologize that, you know, we're sitting here discussing you and your job and how, you know, um, like Mr. Chabano said, you know, um, us as a committee um, kind of failed ourselves or even maybe even you in regards to not carrying it, this policy out the way it's supposed to be met. Um, so thank you for bearing with me and, um, you know, the rest of us. It's just about trying to get it right uh, that's how I feel, trying to get it right, um, not necessarily for you, um, for you, but even for when we move forward, um, you know, maybe even 10 years down the line that, you know, if Roberto and Steven are still on the committee, um, you know, they're able to. Fall off, Kim? <laughs> oh, Aaron, you too, you're young. Um, me and Mr. Chavano are old. <laughs> And Joanne, you are too. So, um, but that you guys, you know, that we can carry it on in the way it was meant to be, you know. So I just think, you know, so I want to thank you for that. So thank you. I, I totally understand. I really do. It's a discussion that needs to happen and we need to move forward and make things better. Yep. And as Tegan would say, all done. Yes. <laughs> all right. Anything else on this? All right. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn by Mr. Marino and Ms. Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Mr. Lobby. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.